our top story, everybody knows what it's going to be, Red Dwarf and the Seven Planets. <laughs> so I went to exoplanets.org yesterday, and I checked how many planets we have detected outside of our solar system. Um, we have 2,950 confirmed planets out there. Plus, there's some unconfirmed candidates for over five, almost 5,500 potential planets out there. So what, who cares about another seven? OK, <laughs> if we added seven more, ooh, exciting. Is that really news? Well, yes, because this is seven planets in one system. This is the TRAPPIST-1 system. And TRAPPIST is this long involved acronym that I'm not going to try and remember. But basically, we're looking at a star and detecting the planets passing in front of that star and the light of the star decreasing just a little bit. Okay, And that's what the TRAPPIST uh, project is, ha has been doing. And the TRAPPIST-1 system, the Spitzer Space Telescope did follow-up observations on it and got confirmation of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven planets around it. Now, what makes it cool is that the colors here indicate the habitable zone. Basically, the zone in which liquid water could exist on an Earth-sized planet. So the green is the habitable zone. And what do we get? We get three planets directly in the habitable zone around this star. All right, so for TRAPPIST-1, we have seven planets. All of them are Earth-sized. This is the largest number of Earth-sized planets in a single system. We have three planets in, a habitable, in the habitable zone. This is the largest number of Earth-sized planets in the habitable zone for any system. And what I think is actually most important is it orbits a red dwarf star, not just any red dwarf star, a tiny red dwarf star with 8% the mass of the sun, OK? This red dwarf star is only 85 times the mass of Jupiter, right? It, it, we theorize that you probably need about 70 times the mass of Jupiter in order to become a star. So this is just above the stellar cutoff. If the smallest stars in the universe can have this many planets, and the smallest stars are the most abundant stars in the universe, we got a lot of planets out there. And that, to me, is what's really exciting about this, OK? The other thing to know about this is that because it's a small red dwarf star, these, star, these planets are in really close. How close? All of these planets, all seven of these planets, are in here. And this is the orbit of Mercury, OK? They are well inside the orbit of Mercury. Okay? They are down to less than 6% of the Earth-Sun distance. That's tiny, okay? compact in there. So it shows you that in these red dwarf planetary systems, the, the planets have to be huddled up close to the fire to stay warm right? Uh, in order to, uh, for this. All right? Now, these, however, are not what we see. These are artist depictions, OK? They're artist drawings of what they could possibly look like. Do we know what they look like? Absolutely not. What did we actually see? I like to show you the real data, OK? So this is the data of what we saw. And here it is, right there. This is what we saw. Now, what you're seeing is the light curve, OK? So this is the light of the star. And you see these dips here, these drop downs? This is when a planet passes in front of the star, and the light of the star decreases by, that, by a little bit, little bit. You'll notice that this is 98%. So the, the total drop here would be 2%. OK, that's the maximum drop is like a couple percent. All right, so we're seeing these 1% drops in the light, and from them, detecting that with our planets there. Why? Because they are periodic. So look at B, 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 B. You see these periodic dips as the planet passes around. Every time it orbits, it passes in front, OK? And then you've got the same for C, D, E, F, N, G, G, and H. Although I noticed in the data that they released, there's only one H. 
So um, that's kind of hard to say. I'm sure they have much more to indicate the, the long term of, of, of age, but the data that they released. So this is how we actually see them. We just see the drop in the light to detect the planet passing in front of it. We see that it's periodic, and that gives us confidence that these are planets passing in front of a star. So this is a really cool system that you heard, probably heard a lot about. My mom actually started asking me about it. So I know it has to have been made a lot of press when my mom is asking me about it. OK, the star is only 40 light years away. It is, I said it's a mass about 8 that of the sun, but its diameter is only 10% larger than that of Jupiter. Here's a drawing. That's the size of Jupiter. This is the size of the TRAPPIST-1 star. You add 80 times the mass, 85 times the mass of Jupiter, but it only grows by about 10% in diameter. That's the sort of thing that happens as you go from large planets to small stars. The planet sizes, they're all around Earth size from three quarters to just over one. The mass estimates based on some density uh, ideas um, go from about 40% to 1.4 times Earth. So these are Earth size, okay? So they're not only Earth diameter, they're also Earth mass, which gives us Great hope that they will be rocky and not gaseous. I mean, one thing is that they could be Earth-sized, but they could be mini Neptunes instead of being Earth-like, right? So we know that they're Earth-sized. We do not know that they're Earth-like. Um, and as I said, the orbits are tiny, uh, from 1% to 6% that of Earth. The period are one and a half to 20 days, okay? Orbiting around the planet, or the planet orbiting around the star once every week up to three weeks maximum. It means that these planets are likely to be tidally locked. There is no dark side of the moon. The, every, every part of the moon gets light. But on these planets, they are tidally locked to their star, so they do have a dark side. They would have a side that's permanently in light and a side that's permanently in dark. All right. The other cool thing is if you could imagine sitting on one of those planets and seeing the other planets in the sky, they'd be big. From one planet to, an, to another, it could, it could be as big as three times the size of the full moon. All right, so this is a whoa, cool imagination of a, a, a wonderful system uh, and shows you that we have an amazing number of discoveries out, uh, out there possible uh, when we're looking at extrasolar planetary systems. Yes, question? So uh, this is a question I don't have a, have a good answer for, um, but let me repeat the question to the online audience. So the, um, when you form a solar system, you actually form lots of planetesimals up to the moon-sized and start to build up towards earth size. And when they gravitationally interact, they can become uh, unstable and kick planets all over, then can crash in. So the question is, how do you get seven planets in such a tight configuration and keep it stable? I don't know. Um, we, did, <laughs> we just discovered this. Um, and I haven't uh, gone, I, ha I haven't seen any analysis to see what the stability of the system is. Are there resonances in these orbits? Uh, if you look at the orbits of the moons of Jupiter, there are resonances between the first, the second, and the third of the Galilean moons. Uh, and those resonances hold, make the orbits stable. Um, I don't know if this star is billions of years old. Has, has this system been around for a billion years? I don't, I don't know enough details of the star to, 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 to say that. So there's, um, yeah, you are right. That's, a, that's an interesting question, and I'm sure somebody, somebody out there knows the answer already, just not me right now. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah. You just answer it. They don't know the age of the star. I don't know the age of the star. Maybe somebody else does, but it's hard to, to, to measure ages, uh, especially, well, they can measure ages for these young, these small stars, um, by looking at the lines of the uh, volatile elements in the atmosphere, the elements that disappear o over time. Um, but I do not know that they've done, done that yet. Yeah? My question is about the tidally locked. Does yeah. that, um, is there a limitation on the rotation of a planet that just can't rotate right. so fast that it could rotate around the star also? Right, so, so the point is, is that when two bodies uh, are close enough together, uh, gra gravity will produce a tidal locking because there won't be there'll be, there'll be inhomogeneities in the structure internal structure. So it'll wobble, it, it, it'll slow down the rotation until one side always faces it. Uh, Earth and the moon. Right now, the moon al always has the same side facing Earth. Right. Uh, in about I don't know a few hundred million years, Earth will always have the same side facing the moon. 
okay, as Earth and Moon set, settle into a system where they're tidally locked. Uh, Pluto and Charon are tidally locked. They always have the same side facing. So it, in that same process is uh, believed to probably be in effect here, uh, where all seven of these planets are tidally locked to their star. They're close enough in for that to happen. All right, last question, then I have to move on, because I there don't want to delay Lauren's talk too much. Are there any other uh, planets in the system besides these seven? Are there any other planets in the system besides seven? Not that we have detected, OK? Um, it actually, originally, the uh, TRAPPIST folks detected two planets, the inner two planets. Um, and it's the Spitzer follow-up that detected uh, seven. Um, maybe there are more. Um, complex signals uh, take a while to be deconvolved. Uh, but um, they will c continue to look to study the system to see what they can find. Okay. All right, let me move on to my second story. Uh, and my second story is the 30th anniversary of Supernova 1987A. How many people remember in 1987 when we, when we saw this? Okay, not that many. Okay, I was, wow, where was I? Uh, I, was at, I, I was in college back then. Uh, I was in college, uh, and you know, I actually thought a friend of mine was joking and saying, oh, we saw a supernova, because you never see a supernova. It's been 400 years since the invention of the telescope, and we haven't seen a supernova nearby until 1987. So this is a field of stars, and on February 23rd, 1987, boom, okay? Uh, we had a star explode as a supernova, all right? Um, and as I said, we haven't had a nearby one. This one is nearby, but not quite so nearby. Um, it's actually in the Large Magellanic Cloud, so it's about 170,000 light years away. All right, we should get one supernova every 100 years in our own galaxy. We haven't seen one um, since 1600s. Uh, it's a real <laughs> pain. All right, um, it turned out it was a blue supergiant that exploded, which at the time we didn't think blue supergiants could go supernova. We have since been corrected by nature itself um, and then uh, adjusted our s scientific understanding to go, yeah, all right, now we can see how blue supergiants can uh, explode. Um, and it was the first uh, supernova for which neutrinos were observed. We have these neutrino detectors um, looking for neutrinos from the sun. They actually detected like nine neutrinos from this supernova. Um, they actually, they, and they detected them a couple hours before the star brightened. Okay, that's just the way the physics of it, of, of it works out, of the supernova works out. The neutrinos were released before the light is actually released. Um, and so they're saying, however, uh, a star of this size should collapse to form a neutron star. And for 30 years, we've been looking for that neutron star, and we still haven't found it. Um, so something else funky is going on there. There is a neutron star that we're looking for. All right. Uh, so let's talk about where it is. It's in the Large Magellanic Cloud. Here is a um, visualization to show you just how small and tiny it is on the sky. That's the uh, uh, Tarantula Nebula above. So we're below the Tarantula Nebula in the Large Magellanic Cloud. And we keep going in and keep going in. <laughs> yeah, you'd never find this star unless it exploded. <laughs> and that is what Supernova 1987A looks to like um, today with the Hubble Space Telescope. So um, actually, this should say 2017. I thought this was the June 2016 image. It's actually the January 2017 image. I'm, I'm wrong on that. Uh, but you can see that here is where the supernova occurred, all right? This ring here and these other two rings were pre-existing. Uh, they were uh, out there. Actually, I'm going to show you. This is what Hubble saw in 2017, um, and this is what Hubble saw in 1994. Um, I'm going to use the 1994 image to show you the details, okay? So this is the position where the supernova occurred, okay? Um, these are foreground stars. Don't let them confuse you. They're not brightening. Uh, of, they're not associated with the supernova. Um, these outer rings are a somewhat of a mystery. Um, they were obviously released before the supernova. Um, they were illuminated by the, um, the uh, they are ionized by the flash of the supernova, um, and they appeared a few months after the supernova. Um, how they formed before that, we're not sure. Okay, we had a couple ideas, and um, then those turned out to not be so right. 
Um, but that's science, you know, you take your best guess and then if it's wrong, you go back and do another one. Um, this inner ring, however, is the really cool thing, okay? This is a radio ring that's about one light year across, 1.3 light years across, okay? And we've watched the development of that from 1994 to 2016, uh, and that's shown in this movie. So you can see the ring starts out relatively, and then it starts to light as the blast wave hits it, and all of the uh, dense regions in the ring become illuminated over the years, okay? This is the blast wave from the uh, supernova spreading out and hitting the ring, which I can use my hands to show you this, but it's so much easier if I happen to have a supercomputer simulation running adaptive mesh refinement at an effective resolution of 2048 cubed. Oh, I do happen to have one of those. <laughs> it's on my next slide. So this is a simulation from a, a uh, a uh, gentleman in Italy, um, and he shared the data with me, and I was able to visualize it to show you uh, the blast wave running across the ring. So here is the Sandiliac star, and here is the ring, okay, and here is the simulation. That's the supernova, and you can see the blast wave moving out and hitting the ring, and as it hits the ring, the dense clumps in the ring are heated and ionized. And if we rotate around, you can see the structure of that ring. And that's the 30-year history of supernova 1987A. So, whoops. So this is what this supernova looks like after 30 years. And it's been really cool being able to watch something develop for 30 years. And what's even cooler is to think about what will look like a thousand years later because on the left I'm showing you the crab supernova remnant, and, we ob and Chinese astronomers observed the crab supernova explode on July 4th, 1054, almost a thousand years ago. So this is a 30-year-old supernova remnant, you can see that stuff in here, um, and this is a thousand-year-old supernova remnant. And it will be cool for astronomy to be able to watch this and see that supernova, they grow up so fast. <laughs>